Is this Australia's next feral menace? They're still a feral animal on the park, so as nice as they are, they're still a feral animal here. Or will Australia be the last stronghold for an endangered species? Banting may very well go extinct in the next 50 to 100 years in their native habitat, but we'll still have, still have them in Australia. There's a clash of values when it comes to the future of this beautiful beast. But is Australia big enough for one more exotic species? This is all that's left of Victoria's settlement. It was established in 1838 with dreams of becoming the next Singapore. But the tropics conspired against the desperate settlers. Victoria's settlement was eventually abandoned in 1849, but that actually marked the beginning of one of the most remarkable stories of survival in the history of Australia. Before the settlers left, they let loose all of their livestock, which included 20 of these magnificent animals. They're called Banteng, and they're native to Southeast Asia. For over a century, no one knew that they ran wild across part of the top end. Today, they number over 5,000 head, and we know next to nothing about them. Corey Bradshaw has been given the job of studying Australia's Banteng. Never even heard of the species before uh, until someone said, oh, there's a mob of Banteng up there. And I knew I'd heard that word somewhere before, but I actually had to go to the internet and say, ah. Oh. <laughs> His research will help decide their fate, but studying Banteng is no simple walk in the park. They're shy, elusive and very smart. I had visions of, you know, we'd go up and catch a couple hundred of them and put ear tags in and go up following ear and count them and see which ones had tags. But uh, catching these things in a non-lethal way is rather difficult. Last year, Corey captured just five males and fitted them with tracking collars. Can't that shot. Mate, got him. Donald, time, uh, take time now for drug in, drug in. Collar 214, 080 frequency. These collars are worth $10,000 each, and they use GPS to plot the location of the animal every three hours. One year later, and these animals are spread out across the Coburg Peninsula. And Corey wants his collars back. The collars have a radio transmitter that allows us to locate them. But it turns out that the Banteng have outwitted Corey. Unbelievable. The third one today I found on the ground. Geez, they seem to be able to throw them pretty easy. Yeah, I don't know. These um, fabric here seems really worn and it's falling apart at places. Would the data be any good in there? Oh, yeah, yeah, I reckon. Um, this stores the GPS location. So, with any luck, until the animal drop this, we'll have lots of good data. So, let's uh, see what's on there. Okay, let's go have a look. Corey has been using more than just a bunch of radio collars to learn the secrets of the Aussie Bantang. You know, have a look at this, Paul. Now, that really is quite a dollop, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they get Beautiful. bigger than it. Yeah, what we've been doing with this is we've actually been doing some chemical analysis to look how the animals have been changing from um, a grass diet to a leaf diet, so a brown diet. So they actually diet. switch through the year? Well, yeah, and as the, as the dry season um, gets drier, the animals often run out of grass and uh, they have to switch to the trees. Now, don't forget to wash your hands before lunch. <laughs> The whole of the Coburg Peninsula is a national park, and they have a problem with Bantang. Do they do much damage in the park? They do. All feral animals impact on 
on a park, but uh, I guess in a way they, they don't have as much impact as, for example, buffaloes and wild pigs do on the park itself. But the Bantang are owned by the traditional owners of the Coburg Peninsula, and they're only too happy to have the Bantang around. Bantang is a good source of food for the people. Um, being a big animal, we don't have to go and hunt regularly like as if you have to go hunt a wallaby. I can't see myself running out chasing it with a spear. No. <laughs> And Corey revealed another twist in this saga when he took a closer look at the Bantang's DNA. We actually discovered there was no evidence for hybridisation with any other cattle species. So these are purebred Bantang, the largest wild population of them anywhere in the world. In their native habitat, wild Bantang are really quite rare. In fact, they're endangered. Which makes Bantang tricky management problem for national parks. Well, it's a bit of an ecological dilemma insofar as we've got a large herd of feral animals in a national park where we're trying to maintain the biodiversity of the park. But um, we've also got the situation where it's the largest wild herd of these cattle in the world left remaining. So we've got two different issues there, opposing issues. First thing it's going to do is use this to communicate with the collar of a um, ultra high frequency. So I'm just going to turn this on. Back at camp, Corey prepares to download the data from the collars we picked up earlier. And the news is not good. Oh, that's a little bit disappointing. Well, we can try the other collars. I'm sure that uh, we're going to get a bit more than that. Unfortunately, the other two collars showed the same pattern. The animals had managed to lose the collars within a month or two of them being put on. But at least there was 30 days of good data to be retrieved. Oh, here we go. All data are saved. So right. let's, let's see if we can get something on the, up here. Right. So it looks like it's Not maintaining good. a very tight home range because it's just walking backwards and forwards over itself. It does. The animals keep to a small range with the occasional longer wanderings. These animals are tied to a specific swamp. They have very distinct family groups and they're limited by water. They don't go far from water at all. It's one explanation why, after 150 years, the Bantang have not spread beyond the Coburg Peninsula. Corey's research has shown that Australia has the largest and healthiest herd of wild Bantang in the world. So perhaps we have an obligation to keep them here. If they are considered of conservation value in Australia, they might have to be put on our own lists of endangered and, and vulnerable species. And perhaps this is a model for protecting other endangered species. There is a possibility that in the future, as we reduce habitats around the world, large animals, especially that require big ranges, need lots of area to survive, that they're just not going to have that area left. Now, this example shows that you can move endangered animals in, into a situation where they're unlikely to go extinct. The future of the Bantang in Australia will no doubt cause some deep soul-searching for wildlife management agencies. As for the animals themselves, they're content to remain hidden in the night. Unexpected guests that may end up as the last of their kind.